Good morning, everyone. Bonjour et bienvenue à vous tous, chers collègues, amis et distingués invités. I'm very pleased to welcome you all today for this very special event. We're delighted to finally be able to come together to proceed to the official installation of McGill's 20th Chancellor, Mr. John McCall McBain, who has not now been in office for almost a year. I think you all know why we didn't do it earlier, but we did promise him that this ceremony would be held before the end of his term, and we're very happy that this day has finally arrived. The chancellors play a very important role in the life of McGill University. The chancellor is the titular head of the university and is an ex official member of the Board of Governors. He presides over all convocation ceremonies and confers all academic degrees once they are granted by Senate. And so the installation of a chancellor is a very special moment for all of us to witness. McGill University is extremely fortunate to have John McCall McBain as our new chancellor. He's a great supporter of the university and a tireless champion of education and of its transformative power. Alors que McGill entame son troisième siècle avec la ferme détermination de contribuer à relever les défis qui le marqueront, notre université est privilégiée de pouvoir compter sur l'expérience, le dévouement et le leadership hors pair de John McCall McBain dans la poursuite de cette mission d'enseignement et de recherche ainsi que de service à la communauté. Au nom de toute la communauté mégilloise, j'aimerais lui exprimer notre immense gratitude The whole McGill community joins me in welcoming John to his role. And I now invite Mr. Ram Panda, Chair of the Board of Governors, to preside over the installation ceremony. Ram. Merci, Madame. Good morning. By virtue of my office as uh, President of the Royal Institution for the Advancement of Learning, and as chair of the Board of Governors of McGill University, I declare that the governors have, in accordance with the statutes of this university, nominated and appointed Mr. John McCall McBain to be Chancellor of McGill University. I therefore invite him to come forward to take the oath of office and be installed in the chancellorship. John H. McCall McBain, the governors of this university have nominated and appointed you to the high office of chancellor. Do you promise to fulfill the duties and obligations of the chancellorship in accordance with the charter and statutes of this university and in all ways properly open to you to promote the interests of the Royal Institution for the Advancement of Learning 
and the welfare of McGill University? I do. Then? The ring. So, <laughs> <laughs> then, by virtue of the authority vested in me as uh, president of the Royal Institution for the Adv Advancement of Learning, I install you in your office as the 20th Chancellor of McGill University. Mr. Chancellor, I invite you to address all those assembled here today. Thank you, Ram. Mr. Chairman of the Board, Ram Panda, Madame la Principale, Suzanne Fortier, who together have taken McGill to new heights as a great, I think, once in a lifetime team. Members of the Board, distinguished faculty, visiting delegates from sister universities, colleagues, friends, and family. Family represented today by my wife, Marcy, and my daughter, eldest daughter, Alexandra. Je vous remercie sincèrement d'être ici aujourd'hui, et je vous remercie de votre soutien et de votre confiance. Pendant mon travail en tant que chancelier, à date, Suzanne et moi avons presque toujours parlé ensemble en français. Bon à savoir pour une université anglophone au Québec. It's a singular honor for me to stand before you in this historic building as a newly installed Chancellor McGill, and a great pleasure to return to this remarkable university where I spent my favorite years as a student and student leader, having been president of Welcome Week, Winter Carnival, and finally the McGill Student Society. J'ai l'honneur de précéder par 19 chanceliers illustrés et accomplis, dont un premier ministre et un juge de la Cour suprême qui ont tous mis leur immense expérience, leur sagesse et leur dévouement au service de notre université. Many accomplished chancellors have preceded me, but I'm the only one from the most famous small town in the world, Niagara Falls, <laughs> Canada. <laughs> I would like to my, express my thanks to Michael Meehan, my immediate predecessor, who set a very, very high standard. He's a model ambassador and consistently leads with his intelligence, integrity, and grace to McGill. I'll clearly need help on that grace point. <laughs> his calm reassurance has been invaluable, and I wish him the best in his new role as Chancellor Emeritus. Thank you, Michael. For the next week or so, I'll be presiding over spring graduations for the class of 2022. I'm going to talk to them about those little moments of joy, les petits moments de joie dans la vie. You know there's those little moments of joy probably happening to me today, right now, when you sort of start to cry with joy, or when your voice breaks up because you're about to cry with joy. I will tell the audience that this will happen when they see in front of their eyes all those years of encouragement, of progress, of setbacks, of advice, and of counsel, all those parts coming together as their daughter or son, granddaughter or grandson, friend or partner, stands to cross the stage to begin the next phase of their life. I recommend to them not to hold back on their joy, on their tears, on the breaking of their voice. This is real life. Live the moment, let it happen. 
So these are moments when either you're so happy to be part of changing someone's life or lives that you can see it happen before your very eyes, or when you take a moment to appreciate life itself when all things just seem to come together. No, these are not moments of ego or chest beating, and yes, there will be other moments in life when you cry for sadness. But for these graduates and graduations, I'll be t talking to them about these little moments of joy. So today, not only for the graduate, for all of us assembled today, try to balance your life with joy, or better yet, put more weight on the joy part with such moments of crying with joy. So this issue of joy came to me, and I realized that it happens to me every single time I'm announcing a new Macomb and Scholar at McGill that have just been awarded the scholarship. We'd like to do it in person, but we're on Zoom, and they come in and we tell them they've, they've won the scholarship. And I have to take a second or two to avoid a major tearful moment, as they do. And I can see before my eyes a life changing for the better because of this defining moment of their lives. I'm so joyful to have been a small part in changing their future path as a student for the better. I know that the same is true for my wife, Marcy, when she also talks to them. And we've got a lot of McCombe Gaines scholars sitting back there, and I know they've got calls from myself and Marcy on a few occasions they probably remember for a long time. Un autre exemple de ces moments de joie s'est passé il y a deux semaines, quand le principal, réfléchissant sur sa vie de principal et vice-chancier à Miguel, a dit au milieu d'un rendez-vous avec beaucoup de personnes de l'université, le travail d'un leader, c'est de passer le flambeau. Quel moment si précieux pour Suzanne, en réfléchissant sur ses années à McGill. That must have been a moment when Suzanne was appreciating life and reflecting on how all the things have just come together at the end of her term to close her term as principal and vice chancellor McGill with so many changes, so many great things. Thank you, Suzanne. So these are moments of joy. Let them happen. But of course, installation as chancellor of Canadian University would not be complete without a hockey reference, and today is no exception. <laughs> the quote is close to my heart, since when I was a, this is really close to my heart, because I was a McGill student, the Montreal Canadiens won three Stanley Cups. I'm just saying that. <laughs> and I think I was 10 the last time the Leafs won the Stanley Cup. Just saying, George. Where's George? <laughs> there he is. Um, but more importantly, it captures my sentiment of this day as I take the role of chancellor. As many of you know, um, in the Canadian's dress room, there's a quote from a classic World War I poem entitled In Flanders Fields. It is written by a Canadian army officer, a physician, and a poet, and of course a McGill graduate, John McRae. It talks about the passing of a torch, similar to what Suzanne was speaking about a few weeks ago. The line said, be yours to hold it high. The honor of being Chancellor McGill is being passed to me today. It's a torch that I intend to hold high as McGill embarks upon its third century. And what a third century it will be. McGill will be concentrating on five major areas. First, opportunities that open doors. Our goal is to ensure that no qualified student is, de is denied a McGill education for economic reasons. Building upon the leadership and vision behind the McCompain Scholarships with Suzanne, Mark Weinstein, my wife and I created, with Franca and uh, Natasha, and building upon that leadership, we will create new opportunities for talented students from all backgrounds to study at McGill without financial barriers. Bring in even, rit even richer range of minds to discover together and enhancing the graduate and postdoctoral fellowships and supporting indigenous education and success. And the second goal for the third century is research that changes lives. For example, revolutionizing, revolutionizing neuroscience with the Montreal Neurological Institute, which is one area of McGill leadership. Secondly, and very importantly, environmental sustainability. McGill takes a unique interdisciplinary approach to environmental studies and with the recent approval from the Quebec government of the redevelopment of the former Royal Victoria Hospital and the largest um, gift from, or not gift, but donation from a Quebec government or any provincial government to a university for building, will be having the sustainability area be housed in the old Royal Victoria Hospital. Also, we're leading in artificial intelligence and data science, and of course, in the medical area, infection and immunity, the McGill Interdisciplinary Initiative on Infection and Immunity will bring together over 250 specialists from medicine, science, engineering, social science, and public policy to find new ways to fight deadly infections and to use our own immune systems as a powerful weapon against disease. Thirdly, innovation that drives progress. McGill is a powerful incubator of new discoveries. We must prepare our students to operate on future speed by creating a vibrant innovation ecosystem on campus. 
one that leverages McGill's unique culture, strengths, and community. And fourth, fourthly, education that shapes future ready students. We hope to ensure that every student has a chance to participate in a meaningful international or community experience. A field study, an academic exchange with partner universities around the world, internships at organizations that complement the student's area of study, and to create a greater range of interdisciplinary and interinstitutional research and learning collaborations. At the McCollum Fame Foundation, we set up an international fellowship program with this goal in mind, to provide students with a study year abroad. Slightly hurt by COVID, but a few made it abroad, and we'll continue. And fifthly, McGill is transforming their library to reflect the needs of today's students, opening up with more light, and creating a few thousand study spaces for students and reinvigorating the lower campus. So in summary, I intend to hold high this torch for excellence, accessibility, and inclusion at our great university and for celebrating the achievements of our students. It's a torch that I intend to hold high for collaborative efforts with our community and to meet the many challenges facing the world. Et c'est un flambeau que j'ai l'intention de porter haut pour engager, inspirer nos, diplôme, nos diplômés à travers le monde. As Suzanne Forti said a few days ago, leadership is a relay race. Thank you for placing your trust and confidence in me, and I will do my utmost to fulfill my duties to the very best of my abilities or more. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Mr. Chancellor, I present to you Annabelle Souta. Is the truth something absolute, or is it something we each construct? Throughout her career, Annabelle Souta has combined the poetic soul of a playwright with the curiosity and drive of an investigative journalist creating a body of work that explores pressing social issues by embracing the multiplicity of lived truths and experiences. Après avoir terminé son diplôme de premier cycle à l'Université de Princeton, Madame Souta a séjourné à Singapour, où elle a enseigné la dramaturgie, la théorie cinématographique et la direction. De retour dans sa ville natale de Montréal en 1998, Annabelle Soutard et son partenaire, l'acteur Alex Ivanovici, ont suivi des candidats politiques partout dans la province en vue de la première élection du Québec depuis le référendum de 1995. They use extensive interviews with Québécois on the campaign trail to create Novembre, a play that sought to illuminate the underground political discourse behind the headline hype. So was born Porte Parole, their award-winning theater company that focuses on works of immediate social relevance. In the more than two decades that followed, Annabelle has built a body of work that explores societal issues as diverse as the energy sector, the Quebec health care system, and political polarization, all built on her deep dive research that draws dialogue from court transcripts, newspapers, clippings, government reports, and her own insightful first-person interviews. In her play Seeds, Suta took documentary theater to a new level of sophistication by incorporating her investigative process into the story itself as she explored the Supreme Court showdown between a Saskatchewan farmer and a global biotech company. Suta's plays have been produced across the country and have garnered critical acclaim. The watershed, originally commissioned by the 2015 Toronto Pan -American, Para Pan American Games program, has since been performed across the country. Jamie Drault, 
une collaboration entre Madame Soutard et la comédienne et dramaturge Christine Beaulieu a remporté le prestigieux prix québécois Michel Tremblay pour le meilleur texte dramatique ainsi que le prix pour le meilleur spectacle de l'année à Montréal de l'Association québécoise des critiques de théâtre. En plus d'avoir été finaliste pour le Grand Prix du Conseil des arts de Montréal et pour le prix littéraire du gouverneur général. Annabelle Soutard's work gives audience multiple viewpoints from which to see contemporary Canadian issues. Canada seems to be deeply divided ideologically today, she has said. My experience traveling around Canada is that people share a lot of common ground but rarely have enough contact with one another to express that common ground. For Annabelle Soutard, there is a tool for nurturing community engagement, for realigning narrative divides, and returning important conversation to everyday citizens. Hers is a mission to make the political personal, because after all, democracy is ultimately about people. Mr. Chancellor, I present to you Annabel Sutta so that you may confer upon her the degree of Doctor of Letters Honoris Causa. Merci, Suzanne, pour ces mots. Monsieur le chancelier, McCall McBain, Madame la principale et vice-chancelière Fortier, Monsieur Panda, président du Conseil des gouverneurs, chers amis, qui reçoivent aussi un doctorat honoris causa aujourd'hui, Mesdames et Messieurs. When Principal Fortier's office contacted me a few months ago to schedule a call, I expected an informal chat with Suzanne about her reaction to my latest theater production. This gives you an idea of how far off my radar was the prospect of receiving a McGill Honorary Doctorate. After I recovered from my initial surprise and shock, I began to ask myself some questions about my reaction. For those of you who know me well, you know that asking questions is a passion of mine. Why am I so surprised that I'm being honored in this way? I became aware through this questioning that since I co-founded Port Pearl Productions 20 years ago with my husband, Alex Ivanovich, I've been harboring a deep professional inferiority complex. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that this feeling should not be a surprise to me or to anyone else. In the 20-year period that I've worked in the theater, the world has witnessed the most rapid and profound transformation of entertainment and information technology since the birth of Western theater in ancient Greece. Digital storytellers today can reach a global audience of billions of people simultaneously by posting simply to their own social media feeds or by distributing their work on a variety of cheap on-demand platforms. With all these free and accessible entertainment sources available to us, why would anyone today risk facing bad weather, crumbling roads, construction detours, and scarce parking to go to the theater in Montreal? Why have I been working as a stage artist and producer for 22 years at a time of unprecedented digital technology innovation? Well, since I only have three to four minutes today to answer this confounding question, and I've probably used up most of that already, I'm going to focus on one concept today that has driven me throughout my career, the concept of engagement. I decided to become a documentary playwright in one eureka moment on a windy autumn evening in 1991. I was an undergraduate student at Princeton University, and that night I wandered into a theater for some distraction, like that. <laughs> that was how I viewed the theater back then, as a place to escape reality. The question, why did I want to escape reality, is a relevant one to ask here, but I won't digress. 
What I encountered on that evening in the documentary theater of the great American playwright and actress, Anna Devere Smith, was a woman profoundly engaged in a conversation about her time. A conversation about how violent conflict can arise between different cultural groups in America if they don't take the time to understand the world from each other's point of view. Anna is an African-American woman, but in a prodigious solo performance where she portrays upwards of 50 characters on stage, black, white, Latino, Hasidic Jew, male, female, old, young, she wasn't simply promoting the rights of her cultural tribe. She was warning the audience that if we don't start listening to each other and finding ways to bridge our ideological and cultural differences, American democracy will collapse under the weight of its citizens' contempt for one another. Sound familiar? This was 30 years ago. In the theater that night, I realized that our world was becoming polarized and that we had to build creative spaces where diverse people could engage in tough conversations about the real world before it was too late. Fast forward 30 years and I realized that despite my professional inferiority complex, through my work and in collaboration with hundreds of talented stage artists in Quebec, one of whom is sitting here today, my husband and creative partner, Alex. I have slowly been building a powerful live platform for real human engagement, while many of my storytelling counterparts in the digital realm have been denaturing the concept of engagement to segregate us into online silos. Engagement today is the word used in digital marketing plans to describe moments when users that might not even be human beings, they could be bots, as Elon Musk is trying to produce to, to prove with Twitter today, when those users click buttons expressing emotions through standardized images of hearts, rainbows, unicorns, champagne glasses, smiley faces, etc. These so-called acts of engagement are the value proposition upon which we have built the first trillion dollar companies, many of which are in Silicon Valley. I participated just last week in one of these acts of engagement. I clicked share on Twitter to disseminate an article about mindful leadership to my followers who all basically think like me, an article I hadn't even fully read while I simultaneously spoke on the phone with my daughter's teacher, walked my dog to the grocery store to save time so I could get home faster to have time to work more after dinner. This proud moment of multitasking produced data about my attention that I unconsciously fed to social media algorithms, which they sold to an advertiser trying to get me to buy a meditation app to relax and regain my focus. And the worst part is, I bought the, the app. <laughs> and I think I'm in the wrong business. It took Principal Fortier calling me up three months ago to offer me an honorary doctorate for me to follow this line of questioning and to gather the courage to speak to you today with pride about what I do in the theater. Over the past 22 years, hundreds of thousands of people have left the comfort of their own homes in Canada, the US, France, Lithuania, Germany, to engage with the work I do. So what does this tell me? Well, for one thing, it makes me truly optimistic about people's appetite for real engagement today. People don't really love sitting at home scrolling and clicking or binge watching on Netflix for too long, for a little bit, yes, but not for too long. They are not very proud of the emojis they emit. People like being challenged. People like being uncomfortable and then getting over their discomfort. People like having disagreements with other people but staying at the table to finish their conversation. People like finding themselves in places where they're not all the same. People really 
want to be engaged today because they're not happy being engagement data points for companies that don't care about whether they are truly engaged. And I believe that the people I'm describing are the people that McGill wants to invite into its community to launch its third bold century. I believe the type of engagement I'm talking about is the foundation upon which Principal Fortier and Chancellor McCall McVean want to build the university's bright future. A foundation of open and respectful dialogue with a community that's curious about and not afraid of its plurality. A community that turns conflict into opportunities for learning. A community that has the courage to have tough conversations about its imperfect past without losing sight of the fact that simply enduring for two centuries as an institution is a miracle and something to be very, very proud of. I am so proud to be joining the McGill community for this next bold step in its evolution. I want to thank my late father, Ian Sutar. I'm gonna try not to cry and just be in a moment of joy. <laughs> class of 54, and my mother, Helgi Sutar, class of 54, who's here today, for endowing me with a passion for McGill through their deep engagement with the community over the years. And I wanna thank my husband, Alex Ivanovich, who has been my creative and personal partner for 25 years, and without whom I never would be standing here today. Thank you so much for this honor. Thank you, Dr. Sutar, Dr. Sutar. I now ask Principal Suzanne Fortier to present our second distinguished guest, Dr. Charlene Drew Jarvis, so that she may be confer have conferred upon her the highest recognition within the university. And I ask Dr. Jarvis to join me on the stage for the honorary degree presentation. Mr. Chancellor, I present to you Dr. Charlene Drew Jarvis. Most of us, if we're lucky, can aspire to one brilliant career. Dr. Charlene Drew Jarvis has lived three. Her first calling, science, runs in the family. Her father, McGill graduate Dr. Charles R. Drew, was a trailblazing researcher, now rightly celebrated as the father of the blood bank. Madame Drew Jarvis a obtenu son doctorat en neurosciences à l'Université de Maryland, College Park, avant de se joindre au National Institute of Mental Health. Pendant sept ans, elle a étudié les systèmes visuels des primates, publiant ses résultats dans les revues scientifiques comme les Annals, Annals of Neurology et le Journal de Neurophysiology. Then, history happened. In the aftermath of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., four days of violent civil unrest shook Dr. Drew Jarvis' hometown of Washington, D.C. She witnessed the devastation of her own community firsthand. The flames died out, but the damage was lasting and profound. Acutely aware of the need for racial justice and economic rebuilding, Dr. Drew Jarvis successfully sought a seat on the Council of the District of Columbia. Over the course of more than two decades on the Council, she would play an instrumental role in rebuilding and growing her community. She led key initiatives to prohibit banks from discriminating against clients based on their neighborhoods. She introduced legislation that led to the construction of the new convention center and what's now known as the Capital One Arena, the sports center considered a driving catalyst in the revitalization of the city's Chinatown. 
the Housing Production Trust Fund legislation that she authored has resulted in tens of millions of dollars in housing for low and moderate income families in the rapidly gentrifying Washington, D.C. In 1996, Charlene Drew Jarvis embarked on a third career, becoming the first woman appointed as president of Southeastern University, founded by the YMCA in 1789. She again established herself as a visionary leader, focusing on entrepreneurship for students, partnering with local organizations to support students' professional development. The leadership of Madame Drew Jarvis lui a valu de nombreuses distinctions, notamment du Collège Amherst, de l'Université George Washington, du Collège Oberlin, de l'Université Howard et de l'American Red Cross. Among the many other awards, the Jewish Community's National Conference of Community and Justice presented her with the Brotherhood Sisterhood Award, and she's been named one of the most powerful women in Washington, D.C. by Washingtonian Magazine and the Washington Business Journal. Now, in her capacity as what she calls working retired, Dr. Jude Jarvis is active on many boards and committees, including boards of Oberlin College and the University of the District of Columbia. And to the McGill's community, great honor. Last year, she was fundamental in helping establish the Dr. Charles R. Drew Graduate Fellowships, which provide financial support for graduates of historically black college and university to pursue graduate studies at McGill. Charlene Drew Jarvis' CV may be non-traditional in his breath, but one can easily trace a meaningful through line. Whatever she wears, she's committed to excellence, holds an unwavering belief in the transformative power of education, and is driven by unquenchable thirst to effect positive change in the world. Mr. Chancellor, I present to you Charlene Drew Jarvis so that you may confer upon her the degree of Honoris Causa Doctor of Science. Dr. Drew Jarvis to make a small address and maybe a fourth career as a speaker. Thank you. Bonjour. That may be all of my French this morning. <laughs> I am so delighted to be here with you this morning to Chancellor McCall McBain, to Principal and Vice Chancellor Fortier to Mr. Pam Panda, the Chair of the Board of Governors, to the faculty, students, staff, and guests, and particularly to Provost Man uh, Manfredi, uh, and to his staff, who have made this day possible for me and for my family. I want to recognize that my sister, Sylvia Drew Ivey, is in the front row, and glad to be here uh, with her this morning. Uh, she is an attorney and a very talented person in her own right. I am fascinated uh, by Annabelle Sutar's presentation this morning on engagement. And I have said as to myself, as I think about it in the future, I, I shall call it staying at the table. Because I really think that that is the message that she's delivered this morning to you at McGill. I think it's an extraordinary message, uh, and it is one that I hope to spread uh, as I go along and perhaps to have a copy of that wonderful speech uh, here at McGill, because I think it is mind-changing, and it's very, very important. On this day, when you are heralding the installation of a new chancellor of McGill University, Chancellor McCall McBain, you have accorded me this tremendous honor. With great humility, I accept this honorary degree 
at the university from which my late father, Dr. Charles R. Drew, received his medical degree in 1933. Perhaps you can understand the gratitude of someone who lost her father at the age of eight when Dr. Drew had not yet turned 46. Chancellor McBain, the heartiest congratulations on your selection by the Board of Governors to be the next president of this great university. You were the valedictorian of your class here at McGill. How fulfilling to be chosen to lead the university at which you were a student. But you've not been a stranger in those years since your graduation. I have read that your beautiful wife, Marcy in blue, uh, here, have been longtime supporters of McGill, as well as patrons in higher education in many, many places. Your most recent landmark gift of $200 million to establish the McComb McBain Scholarships at the graduate level is not only extraordinary, but the support comes with the intention of reducing social barriers to graduate study and fostering talent at the highest level. Bravo. <laughs> this scholarship program comports with the highest values of the mission of this great university, McGill University. I serve as a trustee on the boards of two institutions and as a former college president myself, I understand the challenges to higher education, which you may have to navigate. In these tumultuous times, a leader is called upon not just to manage and to fundraise, which you have done, as my mother would say, to a fair thee well, but to innovate. You fit that description so well. I, I would note in your comments, you made mention of the support of neuroscience. I was trained as a neuroscientist, as you heard, at the National Institute of Mental Health. I was trained under Dr. Mortimer Mishkin. The person who trained Dr. Mortimer Mishkin was Brenda Milner. So you, we have come full circle here in a way. She is an extraordinary woman of age of 105, I understand at the moment. Uh, and so it is with great pride that I am here because Mort Mishkin, who just passed himself, would be very proud of me. <laughs> From my vantage point in the United States, Canada has always been highly regarded for its system of higher education, its health care delivery system, its public schools and colleges, its livable cities, its multiculturalism, and its relatively low crime rate. As an African American, Canada was always seen by us as safe harbor for enslaved people, enslaved people seeking freedom from bondage. The feeling of fairness still exists with respect to treatment of those of different color, religion, place of origin, or sexual identity as part of the DNA of Canada and of McGill University. It is no wonder then that my father sought to obtain his medical training at McGill University after graduating from Amherst College in Massachusetts in 1928. His sister, Elsie, died in the flu epidemic of 1918-19. He has said that this was the period of his first conscious thinking about medicine, for it happened at the time of her death that he was working as a special delivery boy assigned to the duty of carrying mail to the temporary buildings in Washington, D.C., which had been set up as emergency hospitals. At McGill, I learned that he was able to stay in the first three places in his class throughout, and that he finished second in a class of 137 with the degree of MDCM. And he wrote at the time, at this time, and this is from McGill, at this time I was broke, but unfortunately there is at McGill the Williams Prize of $500, which is awarded on the basis of the results of a competitive exam covering the whole of medicine, for which only the top five people in the class are eligible. Fortunately, he said, I was able to win this. 
But he's also written, things were going pretty badly at home as a result of the then crash and rapidly progressive depression in Canada, making it difficult to make ends meet. In the winter of 1931-32, I had already been to the dean to say that I might be forced to drop out of school for a while. This at a time when I already had been nominated for the Alpha Omega Honorary Fraternity. In a 1948 letter, this is again from my dad, to the Rosenwald Fund, who awarded him a $1,000 scholarship to continue his studies. He said, I myself cannot evaluate in its entirety the value of $1,000, which I received at such a crucial moment. Again, in the 1948 um, response to the Rosenwald um, folding, he said, and two years before his untimely death, he wrote a letter to the Rosenwald Fund at the time of its closing, he said, and I quote, I suppose one can never truly repay any benefactor, except by carrying out successfully the program which served as a basis for the assistance. I am indebted to many people and organizations. I shall attempt to repay them by faithfully serving to the best of my ability the sick and the dying, the young men and women I have <clears throat> the pleasure of teaching, and the cause of medicine in making this world a place of less pain and more joy. My father went on to do pioneering research in the storage and preservation of blood at Columbia University, where he earned the Doctor of Medicine degree. And for his work, he has been called the father of blood banking. In 1950, my father and his residents were traveling to a medical conference in Tuskegee, Alabama. The group traveled all night on the southern highways, finding no place along the road that would accept African Americans. Early in the morning, Dr. Drew was driving and fell asleep at the wheel. Although a myth arose, that my father had been denied treatment because of his race, the truth is that he was grievously injured and could not have survived his extensive injuries. Chancellor McBain, my father's gratitude for the financial support that he received from benefactors at McGill University and the Rosenwald Foundation will be mirrored many times over in the course of your presidency and for many, many years to come. Thank you and Marcy for your vision and for your gratitude and for your generosity and my gratitude. Thank you, Dr. Jarvis, and congratulations for your three unbelievable careers and the story of your father. Actually, for everybody who doesn't know, Brenda Miller is 105, and she was a McGill professor into her hundreds. She was also a student of a famous professor. She was a student at McGill of Dr. Wilder Pedenfield in, neuro and, uh, in neuropsychology. So, thank you. I would like to now ask Suzanne Fortier, Principal and Vice Chancellor, to present our third and final distinguished guest, there may be others in the room, but finally, this is we're going to note today, Dr. Nubar Afayan, so that he may be conferred upon him the highest recognition of the university and its power to grant such. And I ask Dr. Afayan to join me at the center stage of the honor for this honorary degree. Professor Forche. Mr. Chancellor, I present to you Dr. Nubara Fayan. What if? It is a simple yet powerful question. Throughout his career, Dr. Nubara Fayan has courageously found possibility in what was deemed impossible. 
and has used his strong science training and keen entrepreneurship acumen to make a significant impact on global health. Nubara Fayan a obtenu son diplôme d'ingénieur à McGill en 1983. Ensuite, il a réalisé des études doctorales au MIT dans un programme à l'époque unique axé sur une discipline émergente et prometteuse, le génie biochimique. We often hear about serial entrepreneurs who move from one idea to another. But Dr. Afayan is something very different, a parallel entrepreneur who continues to share his vision, passion, and experience with the companies that he's co-founded, even as he embarks on another projects. Starting at the age of 24, Dr. Afayan's desire to become a new breed of engineer has driven him to found or co-found more than 80 cutting-edge companies. He grew his first company, Perceptive Biosystems, into a global leader in instrumentation for drug discovery. In 2000, he founded the biotechnology innovation firm Flagship Pioneer, a company that explores new areas of science fosters an environment in which breakthrough innovations can emerge and builds first in-category bio-platform companies around those innovations to transform human health and sustainability. Forbes magazine wrote, wrote that Nubarafayan pushes researchers to ask, what if their craziest ideas were true? A decade ago, he asked a what-if question that would literally prove life-saving for millions of people. What if messenger RNA could be used to produce vaccine and other medicines inside a patient's own body? During the pandemic, the answer turned out uh, to be in one of the companies that he has founded and is a household name, Moderna Therapeutics. Uh, its development of a COVID-19 vaccine with 94.5% efficacy has played a crucial role in helping society get back on its feet, and that includes, of course, all of us who are being to be here together safely. Dr. Afayan traces his what-if philosophy to his transformative experience as an immigrant and a refugee. He was born in Beirut to Armenian parents, and in 1975, civil war forced them to become immigrants again, this time relocating the family to Montreal. Indeed, Dr. Afayans has said that an immigrant's survival mindset is similar to what drives successful innovators and entrepreneurs, making him describe innovation as intellectual immigration. If you're going to innovate, he has said, you're leaving the bounds of what preceded you. If you insist and persist and adapt, eventually you might break through. You then become the native of the new way. Dr. Raphaël a reçu de nombreux prix, notamment celui du pionnier technologique du Forum économique mondial et le prix Golden Door pour ses contributions exceptionnelles à la société américaine en tant que citoyen étranger. En 2021, il a été décoré de l'Ordre national du mérite du Liban pour sa réalisation et son travail dans le développement du vaccin contre la COVID-19. In his tireless quest to improve the human condition, Nubar Afayan has proven himself an intellectual immigrant of the highest order a visionary always striving to create the next new way forward. Mr. Chancellor, I present to you Nuba Rafayan so that you may confer upon him the degree of Doctor of Science honoris causa. I'd like to call upon Dr. Afayan to make his address. Yeah. Stay here.
Thank you, and congratulations, Chancellor McCall McBain. And thank you, Principal and Vice Chancellor Fortier, for that great introduction. And Mr. Panda, Chair of the Board of Governors, it's wonderful to be part of today's momentous celebration. And I want to especially welcome my family members who are here, my wife, Anna, my brother, Levon, his wife, Anna, who joined us for this uh, special occasion. It's a true delight to receive my second degree from McGill University. I received my first degree, a Bachelor of Science in Engineering, nearly 40 years ago, in 1983. As an immigrant accepted into Canada and a first-generation university student, McGill offered me an extraordinary foundation, and I am forever grateful. Many of you have participated in events over the past year celebrating McGill at the threshold of its third century. Milestones like these offer opportunities to reflect, to celebrate, and to look ahead. I'd like to talk to you today about looking ahead, looking ahead with renewed commitment to imagination. As I mentioned, I came here as an immigrant, a political refugee whose family fled Lebanon during its civil war. As my friend and colleague, Raphael Raif, the president of MIT, and a fellow immigrant whose family also fled violence, recently mentioned, when you, leave, when you have to leave somewhere in a hurry, your education is something you can always bring with you. I agree with him, but I'd add this. You can also bring along your special imagination. I believe imagination alongside knowledge, reason, and faith in new possibilities are the core ingredients to innovating our way to a healthier populace and a healthier planet, and there's no time to waste. And my company, Flagship Pioneering, conjuring an imagined future is key to our scientific explorations. As you heard, we always start by asking, what if? We work together to imagine a future scientific outcome that unlocks new capabilities for fighting disease or protecting the environment, unconstrained by what seems possible today. For example, in 2010, we asked, what if patients could harness the information molecule, mRNA, to make drugs inside their own bodies? That what if question and the effort to answer it led to LS18, our 18th life science company a company now known as Moderna. After painstaking years of steadily making engineering and scientific advances, we ultimately found a way to do just that. When COVID came along, mRNA medicines were ready. Moderna brought the world a new class of medicine, not just a single drug, but an entirely new platform of medicines that I believe will play a role in not only preventing and treating COVID, but also other infectious diseases and diseases ranging from HIV to cancer. In the case of Moderna, or any of the other dozens of our pioneering companies, imagination proved as key as command of facts, as key as scientific excellence. When you're trying to accomplish something that has never been done before, or establish an entirely new field, then reason and facts can only get you so far. Over my 35-year career, I've come to believe that we cannot expect extraordinary breakthroughs from reasonable people doing reasonable things. And yet, we spend most of our time, whether it's in the investment business, government grant making, or large company innovation, looking for the most reasonable ideas and insisting that they be highly likely to succeed and still expect breakthroughs. I'm not, to be clear, making an argument against reason, let alone at my alma mater university. I am making an argument against reason alone. I want to encourage you to ask, when we rely only on reason, what is being suppressed? What might happen if alongside the rigor of reason, we also let our imagination and creativity lead? When imagination leads, I believe we open the door for big breakthroughs. It's by removing the constraints of expectations, resources, timelines, and reason that we can press toward the answers that our world needs most. What if? is the question that can guide McGill as it enters a new century. What if should accompany our graduates as they seek ways to put their new, hard-earned degrees to use? What if? Pursuing a what if is not always easy, but it allows you to start with the future you envision. That is to say, imagine, and work back from that future to how you might bring it about. I believe there are two ways to approach work, and for that matter, to approach life. You can either work in the present and move forward to the future that will result from that, 
Or you can envision alternative futures, choose one of them as your destination, and then work in service of creating that future. I'm not saying one path is better than the other, but I believe that if you want to bring about true groundbreaking transformation, creating a strategy from the present forward will not likely get you there. This practice of not centering your thinking in the present, but in a desired future, is familiar to those of us who are immigrants. As the grandson of Armenian genocide survivors, I know the need to imagine a different future. An imagined future led my family over 50 years from Turkey, where we, le where we lived in ancestral Armenian lands for thousands of years, through Bulgaria and Syria, to eventually Lebanon, where I was born. In the 1970s, fleeing conflict in Beirut, my family imagined a new future right here in Montreal. Many immigrants become adept, adept at the discipline of focusing not on the present circumstances, as tough as they are, but on a desired future. And I think it lends itself to creation and innovation. A study released in the US just last week indicated that per capita, immigrants are about 80% more likely to found a company compared to US-born citizens. And yet, for the last few years, the US has been trying to exclude foreign-born citizens. My immigrant mindset has served me well. My journey out of Lebanon, my education here at McGill, my career and my philanthropic and development work, together with my wife, all of that comes down to the same fundamental choice. Do you apply yourself to the range of choices possible today, or do you instead work in an unexplored territory towards a desired future? I encourage you to consider focusing on a desired future, even a seemingly impossible desired future, for yourself and our world. Imagine what could be and work to make the impossible possible. Now, you don't need to do this imagining all alone. In fact, you shouldn't. It's quite perilous. Engaging in real transformational work is not a singular journey, just like broomball, a sport I learned on campus, just a few feet away from here, as an undergraduate at minus 30 degree temperatures. It is a team sport. Three of my chemical engineering classmates are here with us today, Neil, David, and Norma. Two of them were my teammates. And it's that teamwork that I learned here that has carried forward in making the leaps that come from that type of collaboration. To truly create enduring solutions requires other thinkers, other perspectives, and other disciplines. And this is a critical role for institutions today. How do we create places for people to come together and make room for imagination alongside reason? What kinds of practices will encourage our best collective imagination? How can we transform imaginative ideas into practical solutions that can improve human life and the sustainability of our planet? How can we communicate across divides and differences in ways that strengthen us rather than diminish us? I think a lot about the degree to which impact and transformation are found at the tricky intersection of value and peril. The easiest things have already been discovered, unfortunately. The truly disruptive things left to be discovered are more often closer to the edge of what's possible. In an ecosystem, an edge is where one habitat borders another, where a forest meets a field or an ocean meets a shoreline. At these edges, new things happen. Biodiversity might increase, species might be negatively impacted, or populations might experience significant change. We need institutions that exist at these fruitful borders and support people as they lean towards the edge of what they know and what is possible. Living at the edge does not always feel safe, as anyone who has worked at a startup can tell you. What does it mean to support the cultivation of imagination, the ability of teams of people to keep working at the edge persistently? This is a question every leader who seeks to imagine a new future must take on and is an enterprise that lies at the heart of great universities like McGill. Let me leave you with a very important and current example. At Flagship Pioneer, we're actively imagining a future of preemptive health. Society is increasingly realizing that what we call healthcare is really sick care. What if we focused on stopping disease or delaying it before it takes hold? Disease preemption is desperately needed and increasingly possible. Emerging diagnostics and interventions can improve not only our lifespan, but more importantly, our health span, the period of time we can live in a healthy state free of disease. This may well be the only way to address the spiraling costs of our worldwide healthcare systems. What if we focus our society's powerful imagination on discovering stage zero cancer, not stage four cancer? 
At Flagship Pioneering, we're imagining a future in which we secure our health instead of resigning ourselves to receiving treatment only after we get sick. And we're committed to building the capacity in many different places, including here in Canada. Our commitment to help create a world where disease is preemptive was strongly amplified by our experience fighting the pandemic during the past two years. Through Moderna, we have seen what is possible technically and what impact it can have in just one disease. What if we did this in pandemics of infection, but also slower pandemics of chronic disease, such as cancer, Alzheimer's, obesity, and so on? Working on such global challenges has caused us to think and act globally, even as we form small startup companies. I'm happy to note that nearly a decade into its journey, Moderna recently announced a 10-year partnership with Canada to build a state-of-the-art mRNA vaccine manufacturing facility and support R&D to help grow the life sciences infrastructure in Canada. This adds to similar projects we are undertaking in Australia, in the UK, and in Kenya. To further spread our scientific reach, I'm also proud that McGill has joined Moderna's mRNA access program, which will accelerate new vaccines and medicines for infectious diseases through a collaborative research and preclinical development program. McGill is the first university in Canada to join this effort, and we're very grateful. I'm humbled to play a part in creating this collaboration within a country that accepted my family as political refugees and to contribute in a small way to the future of innovation in Canada. I've always had a robust imagination and an active one, but a 13-year-old boy who arrived here in Montreal in 1975, speaking imperfect French, having never seen snow, never ridden a city bus, never set foot in a biology or chemistry lab. Even he could not have imagined that he would later return to this city and its signature university to claim an honorary degree. The only, the only lesson I can take from that is that we all must dream bigger, reach higher, and realize that so much more is possible than reason alone would assume. So go dream, go imagine, and together, let's change the world. Thank you very much. Unusually, I'd like to just take a second to reflect on the words of my earlier address about joy. And I needed a good example. And here's my example. <laughs> the recent pandemic has made Nubar an example, and such a good example of joy. Just imagine today's honorary doctorate, Nubar Afayan, when he recognized that after 15 years of research and work in a field of unknown possibility, when so many people had tried to second guess the route he had chosen, it finally came to fruition. Finally, after so many years, when the FDA approved the Moderna vaccine for emergency use in the recent pandemic, I imagine that Nobar took a moment to appreciate the joy of life itself and the amazing trajectory. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> From an Armenian immigrant born in Beirut, Lebanon, to Montreal, Canada, as an undergraduate student with his friends here um, at the McGill Engineering faculty, to a savior of millions. Thank you. And of course, when we saw that people could live without the fear of, and when they received the Moderna vaccine, he must have had a little tear in his eye when he saw how he had a big part in changing our lives. Just look around us today. Let's share the moment of joy with Nubar to recognize the seminal work of him and his faith and unwavering belief in science. Let's remember that his work has allowed us to be here today with no masks other than the hidden one that Nubar has quietly made possible with his RMNA vaccine. So I'd like to take a second and all of us stand and applaud. <clears throat> Nubar Afayim, a great McGillian for his work that's important to all of us. Thank you, Nubar. Thank you, Nubar, and thank you to all our very distinguished honorary doctorates. We'll now take a second to watch the Made by McGill video, which marked the McGill Bicentennial Campaign and its new campaign and launch of McGill's third century.
Born from a will. Made here. By dreamers and risk takers. By makers and big thinkers. Through trial and error, we face what's ahead. Staying true to the voice that never fails us. Keep learning. We were made for this. Made by lamplight and late nights. By salut and goodbyes. By questioning everything and feeding our curiosity. By testing our resilience. By finding our limits. By pushing forward and by breaking through. By finding a new way, our own way. We're made where ideas are built and built upon. Where we come together and we rise above. We are made by McGill. Thank you very much. To conclude this ceremony, please stand and join Dr. Smith Bissett in the singing of the Canadian National Anthem. <laughs> 